Hey there, welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth again, Curator of Astronomy for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS, and in this edition, we're covering the dates of May 9th through May 15th. We're going to start by saying farewell to that great constellation of Orion the Hunter, left over from our winter sky, now setting in the west. Then we'll say hello to the very famous Hercules rising out of the east and talk about an interesting object inside of him. And we'll end with a look at the full moon and the total lunar eclipse happening as you wrap up the weekend. So let's get to it. Well, it's that time of year again when we can now say farewell to that great constellation of Orion the Hunter. We talk about him all the time. Because how could you not? He is such a well-known constellation. The group of stars that form Orion are always nice to look at. And if you haven't seen him already, you definitely gotta check him out before he sets in the west. Of course, we know him so well from his belt, the three stars in a row, then his shoulder stars here that are fairly bright. And a little higher up, we have a little more time to see it, is that bright reddish star we call Betelgeuse, right? That star that's at the end of its life and is dying and is much larger than our sun, hundreds of times bigger, and a very famous star that will one day explode in a supernova. And so we can still see some of its reddish glow kind of lingering in that western part of the sky, forming the right shoulder or the right armpit of Orion. A little lower in the sky, a little harder to see are his feet, right? The blue star here of Rigel, his left foot right there. Not as bright is his right foot called Safe here. And I'll kind of complete all corners of Orion with this star here known as Bellatrix. Of course, you probably know the name of that star because of Harry Potter, right? Famous character from those stories. And turning on the constellation, we can see the familiar outline and the picture for this warrior. So at this time of year, we can see him setting in the west gradually. He's not completely gone just yet, but of course he's getting harder and harder to see. So again, definitely take some time to look at him before he sets. And one addition I'll add to this as well is you still have a nice opportunity to see the brightest star in the night sky. So Orion's belt, as we know, kind of points to the left to Sirius right here, also known as the Dog Star. So those are still quite nice to see in this area from right when it gets dark, maybe about nine o'clock until maybe about 10 or 10.30 when they're really, really low in the sky. And then we're gonna start to see them plunge into the sun's glare and reemerge again in the early morning sky in late summer. So it's always farewell for now, but we can always look forward to seeing these great stars and constellations again in the future. Now, as we say farewell to one warrior in the West with Orion, we say hello to another really famous warrior and sometimes known as the hero called Hercules. And he is rising out of the east or northeastern part of the sky. He's not as bright as Orion, so he's a little bit more difficult to see. But if you find him, there is a section that is most noticeable. And that is something called the Keystone of Hercules. That's the shape you find right here, just like a keystone rock in the central part of an arch that holds it all together. Well, that keystone shape marks the body in the central region of Hercules. His legs and arm kind of reach out in sort of different directions from these four corner stars here. Sometimes his head is placed here or over here. It depends on the artist and how you kind of visualize this character. So I'll draw his outline for you so you can see his general shape. And again, you can see these stars aren't super bright for such a famous character. But again, that keystone shape is what you want to look for kind of rising in the east and northeast at this time of the year. Turn around the picture, you can see in Stellarium, his head is placed up here. The legs are on the left side, a little bit more towards the north. Now, we've definitely talked about Hercules in the past, as he is such a famous character from Greek and Roman mythology. And in modern times, he's brought up in pop culture quite a bit, whether it be in movies or shows or books. Of course, we all know the Disney movie Hercules, and that was a movie that I grew up with and is something I quite enjoyed when I was younger. And from many of these stories, you hear two different names. The Roman name is the one we all are familiar with, where he goes by Hercules, but the Greek name is Heracles. And that was actually a way to appease the wife of Zeus, Hera, to name him after her, because Hercules, or Heracles, was actually the love child of an affair that Zeus had with a woman named Alcmene. So this is not Zeus's wife's son, and she despised him quite a bit, and they had many altercations through these various stories because of her rage for Zeus's infidelity. But no matter how you call him, he was very powerful and very strong. That's what he's well known for. And a common story that we've brought up from time to time as well 
was that Hercules had to complete what are called his 12 labors from some of his past wrongdoings to clear his name of his past transgressions. And these 12 labors were these great challenges where he had to defeat these scary creatures and monsters. And more recently, we did talk about two of these characters, famous constellations in our spring sky with Leo as his first labor, also known as the Nemean Lion, and Hydra, the Lernian Hydra that he had to defeat. And he defeated many others as well. You can actually see in the constellation art in Stellarium, he is wrangling a multi-headed snake, which is most likely referring to Hydra as he was cutting off the creature's heads. And in ancient times, there were actually festivals in honor of him, and many leaders and royalty like to associate themselves with this powerful character from these stories. So he's been well regarded for thousands of years. Now, astronomically speaking, there is something quite interesting inside of Hercules that I like to locate, especially if you have binoculars or a telescope. And this is quite famous in this area of the sky, but there's something called the Great Globular Cluster of Hercules, or the Great Hercules Cluster. And that actually sits just above his torso. If you're looking at him in the east, it would sit about here. And I'll turn on our deep sky objects here, and you can see the Great star cluster in Hercules, or the Great Globular Cluster. And this cluster is also known as M13. So we're gonna zoom into this area to get a better view of what's going on with this star cluster. And it is packed full of stars. It's quite amazing. And what we find here is a conglomeration of hundreds of thousands of stars kind of stuffed in a rather small area of space. And this is what's known as a globular cluster. It's a big glob of stars gravitationally bound together. And typically globular clusters are very old. So these stars have gravitationally been bound for so long, they've kind of aged together. And many of them are what are called red giant stars. Very mature stars that have lived for billions of years. And globular clusters can be that old for billions of years. As opposed to open clusters like the Pleiades star cluster that we've talked about recently that's now disappeared in the west. That's an open star cluster of very new hot blue stars. And they don't last very long because they actually drift away from each other and aren't able to live together for as long. They're not gravitationally bound together like something we find here with the Hercules Globular Cluster. Through even a normal telescope, you can see something similar to this. You might not see as many stars, especially with your naked eyes. But this was actually first seen by Edmund Halley back in 1714. We just talked about him because the comet that he predicted to go around the sun every 76 years creates the Eta Aquarius meteor shower that occurred last week. But Edmund Halley was very prolific in the astronomy world and made many different discoveries, including being one of the first to observe this great star cluster in Hercules. And then this was included in Charles Messier's catalog, a French astronomer's catalog, and was entered in as the 13th object. So that's why it's known as M13 as well. And so it's just an amazing cluster of stars. And one of the best pictures comes from the Hubble Space Telescope, where you can just see the core of it just densely packed. Altogether, the entire cluster is about 145 light years across and sits about 22 to 25,000 light years away. It orbits around the center of our galaxy. And generally, globular clusters live above and below our Milky Way disk and can sit in the halo or the bulge of our galaxy. They commonly are in those locations within galaxies throughout the universe. So that is a great object to potentially see, most likely through binoculars or a telescope. If you're in a very, very dark location, there is a chance to see it with your naked eyes, but you have to have all the right conditions met. And it would only look like a little fuzzy blur in the sky if you do have a chance to see it. So maybe you'll find that cluster, but also Hercules, the constellation by finding that keystone shape and maybe the rest of him as well as we see him rising higher and higher out of the eastern sky. By the very end of this week on May 15th and May 16th, we have a full moon. And the full moon in May is usually called the flower moon. I think that's a great name for the moon at this time of year because of course May flowers in the northern hemisphere is middle of the springtime with a lot of flowers blooming and it makes sense to connect the full moon with the flowering plants that we find at this time of the year. A couple years ago I took this picture in my front yard commemorating the full flower moon in May 
of a hibiscus flower and the full moon behind it. So that was nice to capture that in honor of the full flower moon. Now this is a very special full flower moon because we can also call it the full flower blood moon. And that blood moon refers to the fact that for this full moon, there will be a total lunar eclipse. And that is an awesome sight. We don't get them all too often. And this is when we have a lineup between the earth sun and moon and of course they line up pretty well twice a month every month throughout the year for a full moon or a new moon but they're not perfectly lined up because the moon's orbit is tilted with respect to earth's orbit around the sun but every so often the earth moon and sun line up in a very straight line and you can get an eclipse and in this case the moon is passing into earth's shadow and that name eclipse actually relates to the ecliptic the path that the sun makes in the sky you'll notice the moon is situated pretty much on top of it for this to occur and eclipses have to happen on the ecliptic line the plane of our solar system as as you see that happening here. And the great thing about a lunar eclipse is that it can be seen over a really large area of the Earth, as opposed to a solar eclipse where the moon passes in front of the sun and it creates a small shadow on the Earth. That usually happens over a small area of the planet, just like one that happened recently in the very southern part of South America and near Antarctica. And what's interesting about eclipses is they always come in pairs. So if you have one eclipse, usually that's preceded two weeks before or two weeks after with another eclipse and that's the case here we had a partial solar eclipse about two weeks ago and now we're two weeks later with this total lunar eclipse so if you look at an eclipse calendar you'll notice those two week separations between eclipses but here in this great map provided by timeanddate.com they show you the area of the world where this eclipse can be seen and here in the united states especially where we are located on the east coast being in florida in daytona beach here if you're in this pink area here, as shown on this map, you can see the entire lunar eclipse from beginning to end. Here on this side of the map, as that kind of red kind of fades out here, this is an area where you'd see more of the eclipse during moon set. And on this side here is where you'd see more of the eclipse during moon rise. So you don't see as much of the eclipse in these parts here and over here and anywhere out of these kind of shaded territories. So much of Asia here and Oceania down here, kind of the southeastern Asian area and Australia, you can't see any of this lunar eclipse. But you'll notice the United States, North America, and all of South America, the entire lunar eclipse can be seen. So you may be wondering, how is this going to play out? Well, for us here in the United States on the East Coast, at 1027 is when the main part of the partial eclipse begins. So we're going to speed through time in Stellarium. We actually can simulate that in this software, which is really cool. So we're going to make our way to 1027. I'll just kind of quickly move there, and you're going to see the shadow of the Earth moving over the moon and darkening this limb or this side of the moon. You can actually see the curvature of Earth in its shadow across the face of the moon, which is a pretty cool sight to see. But as we continue on here, we're gonna continue moving through time. 1027 was the beginning of the partial eclipse. The total eclipse for us begins at 1129 Eastern Daylight Time. And here's when the moon really turns that reddish color that we see here. And that of course is also why it's called the blood moon. It turns that moon into a kind of a bloody red color. And the reason for this is quite interesting. This is from all of Earth's sunrises and sunsets being projected onto the moon because Earth's atmosphere actually scatters the light around the moon from the sun behind the Earth. And some of that light kind of refracts into the shadow of Earth, turning the shadow into a ruddy kind of red color. And so it doesn't completely blank out the moon, it actually makes the moon very red looking. And of course, for people long ago, this was very startling and a lot of times very scary to see the, the moon all of a sudden turn this color. But it can be quite interesting to see and the color can vary depending on the state of our atmosphere. And what's also nice is you'll notice the stars around the moon kind of reappear because during a full moon, the natural light pollution from the moon obscures much around it. But once it darkens and it can be 10,000 times dimmer, quite a bit dimmer than the full moon, it can drastically affect what you can see around it, which is really cool to see the difference as that plays out. And then we'll continue through this as we see the maximum eclipse that occurs at 1211, again, Eastern daylight time here. 
And then as we move into 1253, it starts to end. It starts to brighten back up again. And then by 155 in the morning, you'll see that end and you'll get back to a regular full flower moon. So it's always so cool to watch this play out as the moon changes its appearance and its color and watching the sky around it when the earth, moon, and sun line up in that nice straight line. Well, that's it for another edition of our Sky Tonight program. As always, we really appreciate you tuning into this program, and we hope to see you back here again for another episode. And if you happen to find yourself in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and check out a show in our Loman planetarium so if you want any more information about what we're doing check out our website and check out our social media channels where we post these videos and other great content from our museum we always have so many fun things going on so with that i like to say happy total lunar eclipse viewing and of course happy stargazing <laughs>